That thing is sketchy, dude. Like, I'm scared for you. Yeah, I, you got a bunch of shit that's going, it's just bad. There's a lot of bad. There's a lot of bad. I was actually going to fucking, like, have you sign a release of liability when it left here, dude. Like, I'm, I won't even, I don't want no riding that thing. That thing is sketchy, dude. Um, with the front suspension is completely big bleep fucked up and disgusting. That car, you need to go sign your will. I'm serious, talk to all your family because there's, there's a 50 50 chance you're gonna fucking die in this thing, dude. You can't do it. It's not gonna drive. You can't drive it like that. It's not gonna work. It's just not gonna work. Oh, yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. We've done, we've done stupider things and we'll continue to do. <laughs> Who says you can't? American car culture has found its way all around the world. It's a national treasure that has gone global and soaked deep into just about every aspect of modern life. And most people don't even know it. I'm Dan Stoner, and I've spent my life searching for the legends of underground car culture hidden in plain sight and telling their stories that nobody else can. Some you might be familiar with, some you might not. These are the stories you've heard of, but have never actually heard. This is the Motor Underground. A real hot rod is sketchy at best. That doesn't mean it shouldn't be built well, but it does mean that a hot rod's not for everyone. I mean, it's sort of like choppers. If you can't walk out of the bar at the end of the night and walk out to your chopper and throw your leg over it and kickstart that thing until your leg turns to rubber in front of a crowd, well then you should probably be making payments on a brand new import bike or a new Yamaha, something safe and reliable. Then again, no one ever remembers anyone leaving a bar on a brand new, safe, reliable, making payments Yamaha. And a hot rod's also like a chopper because all of its parts are visible. Everything. And with 80 years of hot rod history behind us, every single one of those parts means something. Now, this car is a 60s era inspiration, and I've made every single painful decision about each one of these parts a lot more difficult than it ever needed to be. A front engine dragster never had a radiator in it because it never had to keep its engine cool. Those things never ran long enough to have to worry about that. Problem with a street driven car like my hot rod is that you're going to be running long enough where you're going to need to cool the motor. So now we've got this problem to solve. The radiator is in the trunk and it can't do the job that a radiator is supposed to do. So now I've got to get air moving underneath the car and through the radiator in the trunk. That requires some sort of custom solution. It requires some sort of extra magical sheet metal work. I knew one guy who could actually do it. His name's Scotty Chops. He's around the corner from my shop in Hayward, California. So we're gonna head over there next and see what he's got. Looks like it should go back home. <laughs> oh boy, Dan. It's a mess. Look at the clearance. Look at that in front of the cow right there. There's what, an inch and a half? I don't, two inches of clearance? I'm not even sure. Dude. <laughs> the whole thing. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> hey, while we're unloading this car, a quick note about this trailer you keep seeing. At the end of the day, see, a hot rod is really just an attitude that can move under its own power. And to double down on that pre-punk rock organ grinders approach to the world, we dipped the front of that body till it was about an inch and a half off the ground to create that attitude and that severe rake that this car really needed. Practical? <laughs> Not even close. But it also meant that we needed the perfect tilt bed trailer to move this thing around on and not crunch that hundred year old sheet metal. I like doing stuff that requires attention and detail and really like zoning in. You can get lost in sheet metal work. You know, I, I put my headphones on and I'm in a different world. It's, it's like, it's, it's escape from reality, really, you know. Uh, it really, like, 
it is a happy place other than being with my family. It's, it's my happy place, you know. Um, being able to work on a tool that's about 100 years old or so and the history of the tool that has and whoever worked on and whatever they're making to be able to share that history with them. I mean, that's when you're making that panel, you're absorbing all of that stuff. It's, it's, you're connected to all of that. You know, it, it's almost like you're connecting. It's got a soul, you know, and you're, you're a part of it. You're a part of that machine's history. Who knows where that machine's going to go after I'm done, you know, but being able to be a part of that machine, that's a hundred years old. I mean, that's remarkable. You know? So on the rear of the car, uh, the radiator is mounted back there and typically in the back of the car up inside, not a lot of air gets in there. You will get some air, but not probably not enough. So I was trying to think of what I could do that would be visually pleasing along with functional. So then I was thinking, well, okay, if we made something that looked organic on the car, like it could have been factory. So if you're standing from behind and you're looking at it, you see that the car has this many curves. If we made a belly pan with similar curves, it almost would look like it was natural, you know? And then the way that I shaped it, uh, we have it kind of a slant down and then I have some speed holes uh, that are almost facing under the car. So as the air comes up, it almost acts as like a vent to direct the air into the radiator. As we were trying to figure out how to make this thing stay reasonably cool, I realized there's no room for a brake pedal in this car. So now we got to figure out how to reasonably make this thing come to a stop. Okay, so Dan had come in, uh, we were trying to figure this out, what we were going to do with the brakes. Dan came in uh, with an idea uh, from his friend Brendan Murray uh, on a brake lever that he did in his dragster, where it was a master cylinder built onto the chassis with a hand pull, and you would pull it. Now, that's probably not really safe, but it would certainly solve the problem. Will it work? I guess we'll have to find out. So after we got the, uh, the shift handle kind of in place and looking right, you know, I had to plus mess with the ratios too because, you know, you're getting the ratios really far off, right? But we need to make sure that it's enough uh, pressure to be able to stop the car. Um, so the, the shifter had to be at a certain height to, to what I think would work, you know. Um, but Dan brought over this uh, big old metal ball bearing that, was, that he found at like a parachute supply place um, that we were going to use as the shifter, which I thought would be kind of rad, you know. So put that on there and TIG welded it around. Looks great. It looks like a shifter, right? People walk up, they wouldn't even think that that thing's a brake until they look down. Ah, uh, shit, that's the actual break. Dude, this dude's nuts. <laughs> so there's a lot of design problems to solve on this car and a lot of things that I probably made a lot more complicated than necessary, but the thing that's always on my mind is this mystery motor. Like, am I the world's biggest sucker and I just spent all my money on a giant paperweight? Or is this the motor that the organ grinders built and bolted to the back of the Catelli dragster that changed the world? I just don't know yet. Man, I'm nervous about this. I'm never the guy who finds this stuff. I'm always the guy who hears about the guy who finds this stuff. But I do know a guy who can actually decipher everything about this motor. He's an old fueler tuner and his name's Pete Jensen. I've been drag racing for 50 years. I've been drag racing literally since I've been 16 years old. Actually, I've been drag racing longer than that because I started slot car drag racing at San Mateo Fairgrounds when I was 12 years old with a top fuel slot car. So I've been doing this all my life. I was born in San Francisco, raised in South San Francisco, which is car gear heaven. So it's kind of like my birthright. We're supposed to do this. This is what we do. If you're a guy from South City, if you're a gearhead, you do it all your life. It, it's your work. The metal in these 392s is the same metal as in a Brodax block. They're, the metal's really, really good. But we're using nitro, nitro. You, you take an alcohol motor and say you're making a thousand horsepower. Blower, fuel injection, 400 inches, 500 inches, whatever, you're making a thousand horsepower. Now you put nitro in the tank, okay? And all you do is change some jets, just so it gets a little more fuel flow, right? Now you got 2,500 horsepower. Where did you get the, where did you get the horsepower? You didn't change the cam. No cam change is gonna give you 1,500 horsepower. No blower is gonna give you 1,500 horsepower. 
nitro, better living through chemicals, you know, and now, and, and so, and when nitro explodes, it creates its own oxygen. So you put all this volume of fuel in the cylinder, and then when it explodes, when it burns, it creates its oxygen. It's the only fuel when it burns that creates its own oxygen. And so that's better than a blower. So now you got all this oxygen and all a motor is it a heat exchanger. So you got more heat and everything like that. And you got something, you know, now you, you're making maybe 800 horsepower, 500 horsepower a cylinder. Boom, it blows up. <laughs> Kaboom, that's what makes it so much fun. All we're doing is building bombs. And you know, we, we put more fuel in them, we put more mag in them, and then we build bigger parts because we blow those parts up. So it's, it's all stupidity. How Ted came up, there was, there was different block, block fillers back then. The guys were using epoxy, there was a couple other guys were selling stuff. I, you know, it was all like snake oil. Everybody had their secret uh, recipe and everything like that. Well, Ted, he used boring bar shavings and he used magnesium. What we would do was we would mix the magnesium and the boring bar shavings in, in the epoxy, right? And then we would turn the block upside down after we put all the freeze plugs in it and plugged all the holes and everything like that. We'd pour the stuff in. Then we got cement vibrators that, you know, vibrate cement forms, right? Put them on each motor mount, sit the motor outside and vibrate all that down to the deck of the block. So the deck of the block became stronger. In later years, we put walnut shells in it too, because walnut shells are very hard also. So we had boring bar shavings, magnesium, and walnuts, walnut shells ground up. In the later stuff, the block rock is more brown. In the earlier stuff, because of the magnesium and the, the boring bar shavings, it's much grayer, and yours was gray, so that was a, a, an earlier block. Stoner thought it was one of his fuel motors, and I, I don't think it was. Number one, the fuel motors, you went out and you blew them up, you cracked the cylinder walls out, and they went in the junk pile behind the shop. And so they never lasted that long. I mean, that's what people don't understand back then. You went through blocks like a, a son of a bitch. Gotelli at one time, I think, had 36 crate 392s on the back wall. And, that's, and he would sell the one to Masters and Richter every weekend for a buck an inch, $392, because they would blow one up every weekend. And so you broke these things. I thought it was a gas motor, to be quite honest with you. Still do. Off to Gatelli Speed Shop in the town just south of San Francisco, called, well, South San Francisco. Bruno Giannoli has owned a few of his own speed shops in Northern California over the years, but he's back where this motor started its life in the early 60s, the machine shop tucked away behind Gatelli's. <laughs> yeah. Hey! Hello? Get your fucking ass down here! Why? You gonna have sex for me? Yeah, You're yeah, yeah Chilling. hurry up! I'm, some people have to work around here. <laughs> You're full of shit, you're off. <laughs> the funny part of it is, uh, Richter and Masters, they'd blow their engine every second run, ventilate it, right? So Just window those things. So when, when we made the first one, I told uh, my buddy, I go, you know what? Let's go over and see Richter and Masters and see if he's got a, another block. So we told him, you got a block we, we want to put this support plate on, we'll give it to you. Richter and Masters put the motor together and he went to, I think, Long Beach. And, you know, the boys down there, they start laughing. They go, okay, get ready for this thing to disintegrate. They're just expecting him to blow. He's going, Rrr. he made about six runs. And they're going, what the hell is this shit? And he come over and he, and he looked down there and he goes, what's, what's that big thick? I go, well, that's the support plate we got. He, so he goes, oh, shit, that yeah, neat. He goes, shit, he's staying together. I go, yeah, so oh, a couple of weeks later, because I was a champion then. So he called me, he calls me up and he goes, hey, can I get one of those? I go, yeah, they're a hundred bucks. He goes, yeah, I want to try the thing. Unbeknownst to me, he was three blocks away from Milodon. So he took the thing over to Milodon and they copied it. And about two weeks later, I pick up drag news and it says, Milodon's new support plate. 
I go, you fucker. <laughs> Unreal. Man, this motor's giving up a lot of clues. On one hand, Pete's saying that it is a post-1965 gasoline race engine because of the cam he found in it. On the other hand, he's saying that the block is a pre-1965 block because of the concrete that he found in the bottom of it. And yet on the other hand, Bruno Giannoli tells me that it's a one of two engine block that he built with that girdle on the base of it. Okay, there's no doubt this thing was a motor built by Bruno. And there's no doubt it was built for racing. Most of these motors never survived a weekend, much less half a century. But is it the motor that waged war aboard the early Gatelli dragster that a young driver named Denny Milani drove in the early 60s? Denny Milani was not only an original member of the Oregon Grinders racing team, but he was the hired gun who made the Gatelli dragster one of the fastest cars of its time. There were a few drivers behind the wheel of the Gatelli cars. Terrible Ted was known for his temper, and fights with Denny would end with him putting another driver in the seat. But Denny would always come back, and the GOAT would always win with him. Denny was a young rising star in drag racing. He was barely 20 years old when he started driving top fuel dragsters for Gatelli. He and Terrible Ted had a love-hate relationship that lasted just a few short years in the early 60s. But those few years produced a legendary race team that set world records and the bar that the sport was measured by. Who would strap a cruise missile to a barn wagon and expect to make it to town in one piece? I mean, nobody would do that, right? And there are plenty of people out there telling me that I can't put this motor, this old dragster motor, in a street-driven hot rod. But the more I hear that I can't do it, I mean, maybe I got a character flaw, but it just makes me want to do it that much more. So what I needed to do was find somebody who actually sees the world through the same funhouse mirrors that I do but knows how to actually breathe life into old, out-of-date technology like this. Is there anyone out there who can do it? Is there anyone as nuts as me who would do it?